Hello students! I'm Jan and today we're going to be talking about some fundamentals, specifically fundamentals of Linux process loading. This is uh, an entry in our fundamental series of knowledge that you should already have to be able to approach the rest of this course. Just in case there are gaps in the knowledge, hopefully this lecture will fill them in. Excuse me. All right. Um, let's roll. We're going to be using bincat as an example program for this lecture. Uh, bincat, of course, is a uh, program that reads in data from one source and spews it out to standard output. Um, let me show you a replacement for bincat that I wrote just so we have an easier time of, of tracking what is going on. It's quite simple. Here it is, just six lines, um, including curly brackets and so forth of uh, C code, maybe seven or eight, yeah, I'm not counting. Um, that simply uh, opens a file or uh, use a standard um, input if a uh, file isn't specified and continually while there's data reads it and writes it. Nice and simple. All right. Um, let's roll with the life cycle of this uh, file. Of course, you know, we'll start with process creation and we'll end with process termination and we'll cover everything in between. In this lecture, we'll cover these um, first three kind of the loading initialization uh, parts, starting from process creation. So what the heck is a process? We keep using this term um, and the term, of course, has meanings. Uh, every individual program on your computer, when it runs, runs as a process, right? More or less. So uh, your browser is a process. Actually, modern browsers have, generally speaking, one process per tab with additional processes for plugins. This is a security measure. Um, a terminal when you launch it is a process. Microsoft Word is a process and so on. Of course, not on Linux, but the point stands. Uh, every Linux process has a number of attributes that um, it, it contains, some of which are security relevant, some of which the kernel uses to figure out what the hell is going on and so on. These uh, attributes at a very high level are stuff like the current process state. Is the process running? Is the process waiting on some uh, resource to become available? Is the process stopped? If you hit Control Z in your shell, it'll background the process and stop it. And then you can use the FG shell built-in to resume it. Um, does uh, the process um, have a high, low, or what is the priority of the process? This helps the kernel schedule a process. Of course, you have a lot of processes running at any point in time. Your uh, laptop or desktop might have uh, two, four, eight cores, um, and uh, your huge population of processes needs to get scheduled at various times um, among your, your computing cores so that everything runs. Um, the kernel uses process state information to uh, figure this out or, or the scheduling information. Uh, a process has a parent process that created it. We'll talk about that next. Typically, or not typically, but it might have children processes that it creates. It might have sibling processes that its parent also created and so on. These uh, have different security implications, um, but mostly in this lecture, we'll just talk about you know the, the creation of processes. Um, a process will have a number of shared resources that it uses, files, uh, various pipes, such as standard input, standard output, um, sockets, if it uh, does network communications and so forth. Uh, process has its own memory space with which it can do whatever it wants, uh, load other libraries and so forth into this or use it as scratch, but obviously it's just memory. Um, and a process has security context. Um, we, uh, in a different lecture, we, you will either have already heard or you will hear about um, the Linux security context with users, groups, and so forth. There's an additional thing called capabilities, which are tracked per process. Most likely we'll cover those when we talk about sandboxing in a different module. All right, so this is a process at a nutshell, but where do these processes come from? 
Um, in Linux, process propagate by mitosis, more or less. Um, what does this mean? This means that you have an original process and then something happens and you have two processes. In bi the biological sense with cells, uh, the old cell ceases to exist and splits into kind of two new cells. With Linux, it's uh, more of a cloning scenario where a process will call an operating system functionality, um, a Linux kernel system call, um, either fork or new, uh, more recently clone. These two system calls will take the process and just copy it basically. Um, more or less, let's say, uh, an easy way to think of it is just an exact copy. Except for the uh, sec the new process knows that it's a child making the old process the parent. Then the child, if you want to, for example, if you're on your shell and you want to execute bin cat, um, your shell will fork into a child, a parent and a child. And then the child, knowing it's a child, will replace itself using another piece of uh, Linux OS functionality, the clone system call. It'll replace itself with bin cat. And that's how you launch bin cat, right? Um, so that's uh, pretty straightforward. But what does this replacing actually look like? You know, it, it involves loading bin cat. First, it involves emptying out the process. That's nice and easy. The kernel does it. But then it involves loading bin cat. And this is harder. Um, so first, in the loading process, we have to figure out, can we load the file we want to load? Uh, there's a number of reasons why it might fail. The most common one is um, permissions that, that aren't correct. Um, for example, there is no uh, um, execute permissions on that file. That's fine, no problem. You can mark it executable, try it again. But generally speaking, in this scenario, exec, uh, the exec v call will fail and then bash will tell you something along the lines of, you know, whatever file not executable or whatnot. So let's say it's all okay. Then when uh, you run exec v bin cat, the kernel has to decide what to load. And there are a number of different options, right? In order to figure this out, the kernel will actually look at the file and it'll say, what kind of file is it? Look at the beginning. If the file starts with what is called a shebang, a hash exclamation point, the kernel um, will treat this as a script file. You, you generally see this with um, shell scripts, Python scripts, but any uh, script file uh, is like this, and we'll play around with that in a second. Um, what the kernel will do is uh, extract the interpreter from the rest of that line and run that interpreter with the original file as an argument. Let's actually take a look at what happens here. All right, um, let's say I want to have a script and I it's a shell script and I say echo hi, of course, let's uh, launch it. Permission denied, there's that permission check failing. Let's make it executable, launch it again. Okay, that worked. So there's our uh, script, bin sh, echo high, and it is, uh, it works, right? So what happens was the kernel uh, looks at that first line. It sees the, or looks at the first two bytes, really. It sees that hash bang, then it reads the rest of the line and executes that. Nice and simple. Uh, executes that with this file uh, name as an argument. We can actually see this more explicitly if we change this interpreter to something like bin echo, okay? If I just save this file, of course, bin echo will just echo back, you know, whatever you, you, you type in. Um, now, if we execute some script with this bin, bin echo, let me show it to you again, some script, execute it, and it echoes out some script. Why does it do that? Well, the kernel called, uh, saw that bin echo is the interpreter of the script and called bin echo space some script, this exact thing. That, boom, some script. All right. Um, interestingly, this uh, can be recursive. Um, that interpreter can also be a shell script. So if we look at some script two, we create something here that 
calls into some script one and we make that executable and we launch it <laughs> we see echo being called with some script one and script two so what happens here well some script two calls some script as, as its uh, interpreter so this ends up getting executed okay and then some script of course calls echo as its interpreter bin echo so this ends up getting executed and that is exactly what happens when you execute some script too cool um pretty interesting stuff uh of course you can also have arguments here and then they will also be passed on as um arguments to the interpreter um, and it'll just tack on as the last argument the file name very awesome let's uh move on to our um loading process all right so let's say it's not a script file uh then the kernel moves on and looks in a kernel configuration which is exposed in a directory in, in linux in the prof file system um called uh bin format misc bin format is the kernel subsystem that figures out how to execute files bin format misc is this sort of uh way to give it arbitrary configurations of things to execute right um let's take a look at that if we go to proc sys fs bin format misc we see a bunch of different configurations so i have a configuration for jar files um, because I installed the Java runtime at some point. I have a configuration for a bunch of different architectures because I installed the QEMU user static package. If you look at these, uh, like the jar file configuration, it's nice and simple. Um, if it finds that a, a file that I'm trying to execute begins with these bytes um, at offset zero, of course. Um, so right at the beginning, if I have the bytes 50, uh, this is uh, ASCII encoded 504B0304. We can actually see what these bytes are by doing 504B. That's PK. If a file starts with PK, that means it is a um, Java archive, and then it is run with JEXEC, which is a program that runs a Java archive. Super cool stuff. Now I can just dot slash a Java archive, just like I can a shell script or we'll talk later, an elf binary. Interestingly, if you look at these, uh, this QEMU MIPS uh, configuration, this is a configuration to run an elf file. You can see the um, header of an elf file. The 7F E is in ASCII, L in ASCII, F in ASCII, all caps. 7FELF is the L file header uh, magic number um, right at the beginning of the L file. And then it has a bunch of other stuff that needs to match. And then it has a mask of what needs to match and what doesn't need to match because an L file describes um, can, can be for a number of architectures. So this mask on an L file um, with all of these, any, any one bit in it uh, matching will mean that it is a MIPS file. Um, interestingly here, if you look at MIPS, versus MIPS um, Little Endian, there is a slight difference in this uh, mask here. There. Um, and then it'll dis uh, determine, okay, this is an L file for a different architecture. Let's run it in QEMU. Boom. It figures out even the correct QEMU by matching these different MIPS uh, formats. Super interesting stuff. Very fun to mess around with. Um, you can... Uh, set things up here to automatically run windows executables through wine etc etc i wouldn't necessarily recommend that back in uh, when these things were originally introduced like the early 2000s or something the bin format misc i thought it was super awesome i configured um windows executables pe files to automatically run the, their magic numbers pe something 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 to automatically run in wine and this was all great until uh, through some insane situation, I ended up infecting my Linux box with Windows malware because uh, Wine was good enough to emulate that malware. Anyways, uh, 
it uh, can be an interesting journey. Uh, the point is, one takeaway from this is the file extension doesn't matter. .sh, uh, .py does not matter for figuring out what interpreter to use. All that matters is the beginning of that file. All right, let's uh, move on to number three. What if it is not any of these bin format MISC files? What if it is an ELF, um, a dynamic length ELF? So it's a 7F ELF that is uh, that doesn't match any of the bin format MISC configurations and is dynamically linked. Um, this means, dynamically linked means that the L file relies on some libraries that it also needs to load. Uh, and the um, entity that is responsible for loading these libraries and initializing everything and so forth is called the uh, interpreter of that L file, colloquially the loader, right? So let's, um, uh, we'll dive into that next. I'll also mention a statically uh, linked ELF is probably the simplest uh, part of this. The kernel loads it and just jumps into the, the entry point specified in the ELF file. Um, other legacy formats are also supported, but um, it is very, very, very rare to see these, of course. Um, and these, as mentioned before, can be recursive. A um, bin format misc interpreter can be a uh, shell script that has an interpreter that is a normal elf or or you know any crazy combination no problem all right let's uh run so let's say you have a dynamically linked uh elf and you want to load your exact being it uh mentioned the kernel will load both the interpreter and the original binary the you know bin cat or whatever into memory um and figure out and then run the interpreter so let's look at um, this interpreter right now. So let's go back. Um, we can compile, just as a reminder, here's our cat.c. We can compile um, cat.c into cat. Now here is cat. Cool. All right. It, it echoes back what we put to it, or we can, you know, cat out cat.c. Now what? Now we can um, look at the cell file. We've, of course, done that in the binary files lecture, but let's um, look at cat and look at its interpreter. Here's its interpreter. It's uh, just set in one of the headers, LD Linux, blah, blah, blah. Of course, so this is the, the, the file that gets loaded that is responsible for loading everything else. Of course, we can also load this file or execute it directly as a true interpreter uh, and run uh, cat like this, or of course, output cat.c, and it works. Um, this isn't how the kernel runs it. it. It doesn't run it like a shell script with the argument of the file, but it is how, uh, but, but it does faithfully, um, you know, uh, support this sort of calling convention. Anyways, um, the interpreter can also be uh, modified. So there's a utility called patch elf that can set interpreter, let's say some interpreter. You know, obviously this doesn't exist. We'll do cat. So when the interpreter doesn't exist, bizarre stuff happens. So I try to run cat and bash returns with cat, no such file or directory. Why does this happen? Well, it's a very frustrating thing and you might tear out a lot of hair uh, going crazy over this. It happens because bash calls into the kernel uh, when it, it, the child process, when it does exactly calls into the kernel says, hey, replace me with bin bash. The kernel op or bin cat, the kernel or dot slash cat in this case, the kernel will open dot slash cat. It'll see its interpreter, which now is slash some slash interpreter it says, oh, it's a dynamically linked elf. Let's load up this interpreter. It tries to open some interpreter and load into memory. That fails, and the kernel returns with uh, returns from exactly e with a failure case saying, "Hey, there's no such file." Um, so if you look at the exactly um, man page uh, and we look at return values, 
right? Here are the various errors that can go wrong. And one of them is enoent, the file path name, which is the bin, bin cat or, or cat or whatever, or uh, script or elf interpreter does not exist, right? Uh, same with shared libraries. Uh, it, it can fail because of that as well. Um, pretty interesting, huh? Uh, basically, what happens is that um, the uh, whole loading process fails because some dependency isn't there. Uh, and we can, let's see, can we do this? DD? Yeah, awesome. So this is obviously not correct, but uh, you can see LDD and see what libraries depends on, including the interpreter. All right, uh, this is a very useful utility when you want to figure out why a program you're trying to run is not working. So that's the interpreter. Um, let's roll on to uh, how the interpreter then finds other libraries like libc.so that a program might need. Then we'll talk about libc in a, a little bit uh, later. Um, so uh, let's talk about the actual loading process now. So we've, we've had the program, the interpreter loaded by the kernel. Next, the interpreter locates the libraries, and it does this by looking in a number of different places. Uh, and it's a little bit of a, of a, of a crazy uh, long story of uh, evolving formats and, and, and legacy support and so forth. But the, by default, without any extra funny business, we just have to worry about 2D and 2E over here. Um, 2D means it, it looks in a con, uh, system configuration, ld.so.conf, which defines all the various places libraries can be, and it tries to load libraries from there. And then if that fails, it tries slash lib and slash user lib um, for old time's sake. Mostly, we're talking about uh, ld.so.conf, which is you know the biggest thing where you that that you'll see in your everyday interaction with then implement libraries. Um, let's uh, take a look at some of the other th ways that you can uh, mess with library loading though. Um, LD preload is a pretty well known one. You can, act, you can define an environment variable with a path to a library that you can load, um, that will be loaded first before any other libraries are loaded uh, and, and before execution goes on. This is a super useful debugging and also um, has security implications in, in certain contexts. You can uh, create a LD library path environment variable, which will um, set, uh, add an additional path where libraries are uh, looked in for in, where in which libraries are looked for uh, before uh, using the system wide configuration. And then in the binary itself, you can actually mess with it and specify several different places to search for libraries as well. Um, you can use, their, uh, there's a legacy way and a modern way, doesn't really matter. I'll show you the modern way uh, right now. Um, and uh, after the interpreter finds these libraries, it'll load them. Uh, and the libraries might depend on other libraries. Again, this process can also be recursive. Uh, and finally, there's something called relocations. After a library is loaded, it might need to be fixed up in uh, subtle ways, depending on what else was loaded and where the library was loaded. These relocations can be very complicated, um, but re basically in certain scenarios, you might imagine that a library contains a pointer to some um, uh, resource. And if the library is loaded at a different location, at, at whatever location the library is loaded, loaded, that pointer has to be updated so that it points to the correct location. These are relocations and, and libraries um, have uh, tons of them uh, by default. So um, let's look at the loading process in a little uh, more detail on the terminal here. So we're, here we have, again, cat, we can cat out where did cat go? Oh, <laughs> I messed with the interpreter. <laughs> so cat is cat is screwed. All right, let's uh, let's <laughs> recompile cat. All right, here you have cat. 
boom, cat.c, nice and, and, and simple program. I'm gonna use a utility called strace. strace is a very cool utility that, that um, goes through and, and, and prints out all of the uh, system calls, the OS functionality used by a program. And we'll talk about system calls, unfortunately, in the next lecture on the process lifetime. So if I strace cat.c, you can see it does a lot of stuff. Here's that exec VE call in the beginning. So strace actually starts up in that um, child process um, of, uh, of bash. Then uh, um, there is a various, so the BRK, we won't go into this right now. There's various other stuff for setting up um, things. And then here we load this ld.so.cache, which is actually a compiled version of this ld.so.conf. Again, don't worry about it. Basically, uh, it looks at every path listed here, tries this first, it succeeds. And then here you can see it's reading out this uh, 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 library to see various um, properties in it. And here is that this is a uh, 7F in octal ELF. Cool. So it finds uh, libc and then it, it, it runs it. Awesome. Let's talk about LD preload. So with LD preload, you can actually set a library to um, run and override functions of uh, future loaded libraries. Um, I wrote an LD preloader that replaces read with a function that writes pwn into the buffer and returns the size that it wrote. So we won't be reading anything anymore. We'll just use pwn. So let's do LD preload. Uh, let's compile it first. So we compile it as a shared library. Dot so. Okay. And now we can execute it. Uh, with a path, uh, it needs at least some path. Otherwise, it'll search for it in a normal, I think it'll search for it in the normal library path, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then let's call cat, cat.c. And instead of cat.c, we just see pwned over and over and over, because of course it just keeps returning, so cat keeps printing it. Very cool stuff. Um, so that LD preload, if we S trace, uh, this instead, and S trace has a dash capital E where it'll set the environment variable before executing the program. If we do this here like this, then we'll LD preload S trace itself, and that's not what we want because that'll mess everything up. So we do this S trace dash capital E, we run that, and let's uh redirect this. look at just the first bunch of uh, syscalls. Here's that exec. Everything is great. Um, actually, one thing to note, this has 57 environment variables um, that are being passed because this is an environment variable, of course. Uh, if we just do s trace cat.c or s trace cat of cat.c, um, we'll see 56 environment variables, right? So that's an extra environment variable passed as expected. Here's a bunch of pwn being written out. Oh, uh, here's an interesting thing. Here's where it opens this preload.c, loads it, and then later on, it goes on to load um, uh, uh, libc. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. Now, LD preload path or LD library path. It's another uh, thing you can do. And we're just gonna do a cursory look. So let's take LD preload out. LD library, library path. You can set a path here. And now every library that cat depends on, we will first try to load it from this some library path, right? And it tries to be uh, fairly creative with, um, uh, where is it? it tries to load a bunch of variants of, of, of what it needs. 
and then here some library path libc.6 of course all of these there's no such file or directory i didn't create some library path blah and so then it goes on to the default cool stuff i also mentioned by the way ld.so.preload uh if this exists you can list uh ld preload binaries for the uh libraries for the whole system be very careful there's a very easy way to break everything because if you put some library that screws functionality um as listed into preload, you can uh very quickly cease to be able to run anything like you know vi or whatever to undo it cool all right um one thing left to look at uh run path and um our path we just look at run path there one is a new version of the other essentially um you can use the patch elf utility to set our path this actually sets the run path if you do force our path it'll actually set the our path um and you can also set this to wherever some run path where to look for uh libraries and you do cat Okay, now we, we'll run the same thing and uh, just to see the um, the differences here. So some library, that's our LD preload, our LD library path that is uh, being um, used to try to search for libc. It doesn't find libc, then it searches for this run path for libc. It doesn't find it there, no such directory. And then it looks at ld.so.cache and finds it in the first configured um, place. Very cool stuff. Um, roughly speaking, this is the library loading order. Let's see what happens when we have everything, the R path, the library path, and LD preload. Let's just do something that's not there so that it doesn't mess with our execution. All right. So of course, first it tries to load our LD preload <clears throat> and we didn't set a pass. So it tries to load it from a whole, from everywhere, including the LD uh, library path and the run path. And then it tries to load libc. Oh, that's still ha ha. Wow, it's trying to load a lot from everywhere from here, lib x here. So it's just the whole worst case scenario. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, send us down this path rabbit hole, but uh, we went. And then um, it looks at LD preload. Then it finds libc without looking at, interesting. Seems that overrides What if we actually have dot slash preload that is so? Okay, yeah, interesting. That was an in interesting. All right, I don't know what happened there, but you can see uh, preload starts up, uh, gets loaded. The LD preload runs first, and then all the rest of the library resolution and loading, starting with things in the LD library path, then in the run path, then in the system-wide configuration. Very cool. All right. So these uh, libraries get loaded. Potentially this causes uh, other stuff to get loaded as well. And then um, we have the question of where does it all get loaded into? This is an interesting question. Um, I mentioned earlier the process is virtual memory space. Of course, you have tons of processes on your system. As mentioned, everything uh, can be a you know its own process and, and so forth. Um, all of these processes need to be isolated, otherwise there's no security. If uh, you know your video games can start messing with your, I don't know, whatever. I'm not going to come up with the scenario, but processes shouldn't be able to mess with each other's memory by default without additional um, capabilities or additional uh, actions and so forth. So every uh, process has its own virtual memory space. Um, this is the case in more or less all modern uh, multi-process uh, operating systems. And this space for a process will contain the binary uh, such as cat, bin cat or whatever, 
its libraries and it has the heap for dynamically allocated memory, a stack for local function variables and, and, and return addresses and control data and so forth. Um, any other memory mapped by the, the program helper regions and in the top half of every, um, <clears throat> uh, every uh, virtual memory space, kernel memory, um, potentially specialized for that process. Um, all of this virtual memory resides in physical memory in, in, in carefully mapped locations, right? So every process running at the same time, actively running on your machine, has some virtual memory in your physical memory uh, space. But it's obviously not mapped according to its virtual addresses. A process could uh, reserve OX 8000, probably not OX 80,000, let's say, um, in its virtual memory space, another process might reserve that in its in the other process memory space, but they'll actually be located in different places in physical memory with some mapping that the kernel keeps track of, uh, or the 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 memory uh, management subsystem keeps track of to uh, figure out how to direct virtual memory access to physical memory. Point is, you can see a process's um, memory space by looking in proc self maps. Let's take a look. So we can do cat, of course, proc self maps. And this is the memory space of cat. So it loads uh, my cat binary into a couple of uh, different pages here at the kernel loaded here at 555. Blah, blah, blah. This is um, a uh, randomly generated kernel address. If I run it again, or not kernel address, a randomly generated virtual address, sorry about that, um, that the kernel chose to place my binary at. Kernel also chose a uh, address um, from using mmap to place my um, loader at, and then future libraries are loaded right before that address. Um, you know, if I had more and more binaries that is dependent on, Let's look at the real cat. I don't know, it probably depends on the same number of libraries. Um, but it has an additional locale information, I guess, for the help uh, functionality that it loads before libc and so forth. Feature mappings will keep filling in the 7f um, area. Um, then it, uh, a process also has a stack at a random location. And uh, this doesn't use uh, any allocation, so the heap didn't get um, heap space didn't get created, uh, but something that uses uh, dynamic memory allocation will have a heap. And there's some other stuff, um, helper libraries, virtual libraries mapped in by the kernel, um, which we won't talk about in this lecture, but just be aware that they are there. Um, so that is a kernel's virtual memory space. Um, in uh if you're interested you can go to this resource here and and uh read further all right i keep mentioning libc this libc that and we saw libc a bunch of times in for example the memory mappings right here what the hell is libc um libc is a library full of uh, helper functions that is used by almost every uh, program or linked by almost every program. I have almost every process on the size that's inaccurate. It gets loaded as a result of being linked by almost every program into almost every process. And it's a bunch of functionality that you take for granted. If you've, you see you've, you've used printf, that's in libc, scanf, um, malloc and free, that whole allocator library is a subcomponent of libc. And a lot of crazy stuff that you, you likely haven't seen. Um, libc has uh, a lot of uh, things. Um, oops. All right. Uh, it's again, the most common library seen in these, uh, um, on, on Linux at least. Um, of course, statically linked binaries have a much simpler, uh, loading process. They just get loaded, right? So let's take a look at a statically linked version of cat. 
So here is cat static. We can of course cat out the source code. We can, it works exactly the same. The, the difference is if you look at how many bytes cat static versus cat take up, it is huge. Cat is 22 kilobytes compiled. Cat static is almost a megabyte, right? That, and I'm, I'm actually shocked that it's that small, but um, cat static, if you look at proc self maps, much, much simpler. There are no libraries mapped in. Heap is, a heap is allocated. Um, I guess this is something that happens. I, I'm not sure why heap is allocated here, but not in the non-static version. I'm guessing there's just a different set of initialization uh, routines that run. We'll get to those next. Um, but it's simpler. There are no libraries because statically linked binary. Why don't we um, ship everything statically linked for simplicity? I mean, one is this uh, difference in, in file size. You might argue it's not really relevant nowadays, but um, there are various tricks that can be uh, done with sharing pro uh, library memory across processes and so forth, excuse me. Um, but uh, that is less and less critical nowadays in the age of, you know, a lot of memory, um, a lot of drive space. And in fact, languages such as Rust, uh, Preempt uh, mostly support uh, static uh, mapping, uh, static linking. Rust to use C libraries. You, sorry, you can load C libraries and use them in Rust, but Rust libraries are mapped are linked statically. Um, so maybe we'll move more in that direction. I don't know. Both uh, cases exist. One reason until recently not to use static uh, libraries was less um, or statically linked binaries was uh, less security opportunities. I mean, this is slightly less true, but still true. If you look at the dynamic case, um, you have a cat, which is linked in or loaded into this crazy address. And you have the libraries, which are loaded into this crazy address. There are different addresses. You can't actually, by knowing where cat is loaded, you can't know where the libraries are loaded unless you know you, your cat and knows where its libraries are. Um, but oftentimes, even during execution, you might know where, for example, the libraries are loaded, but not where cat is loaded. Um, right now, the way things are, the libraries are loaded right up against each other. Um, so you can know, knowing LD, you can know where libc is and vice versa. But there's no reason that has to be the case. You could load them at completely randomized um, offsets as well. Um, for a statically linked binary, of course, you can't do that. If you notice, it's lo it's loaded at this address, and this address does not change over executions. I mean, the stack and heap still change, but cat is loaded at 40000. Um, recently, we're not going to try. Uh, why not? Let's try it. There is a static PIE. I have no idea if this will work. I've never done this before. Holy shit. Recently, PIE stands for position independent code. This was introduced, wow, to allow statically linked libraries to uh, be position independent. So that's pretty cool. Um, I don't remember if I actually mentioned why, what makes a statically linked li uh, binary statically linked. It is, of course, that all of the libraries like libc are included inside this uh, same binary. That's what makes it big. But it also means that knowing the position of this binary, you also know the position of libc and all the other libraries. That's a uh, security uh, gap between statically and dynamically linked libraries. On the other hand, there are various security problems with dynamically linked binaries that that um, can be taken advantage of. Um, so it's a trade-off. For better or worse, the majority of the uh, programs in a standard Linux distribution are going to be dynamically linked. All right, let's see what we got next. Um, initialization. So this is uh, the last step that we'll talk about today. Uh, after everything is loaded into memory and so forth, it is initialized. Um, every uh, ELF 
binary and library can specify constructions. This is code constructors, sorry. This is code that runs uh, before the program's actually launched. So depending on the version, libc can initialize um, uh, memory regions for dynamic allocation. So we saw a heap show up here in the statically linked case. Oops, I forgot to switch the slides. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, how much did I screw that up? Let's come back there. Okay, you saw this? Yeah, yeah, we saw this. This is important. All right, initialization. Um, constructors run before the uh, program execution starts, before main is executed. And you can specify your own constructors, right? So we can edit cat.c and uh, again, now we want this. We can edit cat.c and we can say attribute constructor. All right, and it'll just print haha. And if you compile this statically or not and execute it, we'll see haha before main is executed. Uh, this is especially useful for um, LD preloading. So let's um, look at our preload.c. This is our pwned. Now we put in this constructor, we compile, and then we run with an LD preload. Let's just get the first, okay. Uh, we didn't compile the LD preload. What happened? Okay, preload. That works. Gets preload. That did not get printed. Let me pause the recording, figure this out, and get back to you. And we are back. Um, sorry about that. I figured it out. In the original version, in what I have on the slides, let me show you the slides, we have uh, puts being used. There was some sort of crazy uh, um, caching problem in uh, puts. There's a or in libc with this, uh, so flushing works, uh, but I, I replaced it with a different solution I'll show you. Um, I mentioned that, um, well, I didn't mention, there's a, an awesome uh, computer science joke that there are two unsolved problems in computer science, naming, uh, shit, sorry, too much lecturing today, uh, naming, caching and off by one errors. All right, let's move on. So let me show you what went wrong and uh, how I fixed it. Um, here is the new fixed preload.c. So in the haha -ha func, uh, well, you can see in my debugging process, I also checked if the name was a problem. So the constructor now called WTF, um, used to have puts, I just changed it to use write directly to bypass all of this, this cache. Invalidation, two unsolved problems in computer science, caching, god damn it. Naming, cache invalidation, and all by one errors. Anyways, uh, if you use write directly bypass uh, libc uh, funny business with puts, it works. So let's compile. Okay, and then we do the LD preload with this, and we see that there is a haha -ha gets printed before all the pwns. 
so this this is neat here but every once in a while you have the opportunity to inject the library into a process using uh uncarefully exposed um functionality for example it's super useful in those cases to be able to run code on library load without having to wait until functions of your library are invoked all right that is it that's all of the uh, process lifetime that we're gonna talk about today uh, it is this lecture ran way longer than I intended this is the case for a lot of my lectures I apologize uh, hopefully you now have a very good understanding of how a process is loaded or how a program becomes a process essentially it's loaded uh, the libraries are loaded and it's initialized all right um, I'll see you next time on the rest of this uh, process runtime on how it actually executes thank you